Okay. So before I get started, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background. Um, the title of this presentation is Healthcare Transitions or um, Consumer and Caregiver, uh, I forgot what they call it, Supported Transitions, but whatever the case is, we know that um, the people that we care for and work with often have frequent transitions. Um, and that in transitions of care, this is the time when some untoward or negative things can happen. And so it is a very important and critical time. And it is important for everybody to be aware of uh, potentials and what's going on. And my, I am a professor of nursing at, at Boise State, and my nursing career really has focused on uh, care coordination, care transitions, transition management, and case management. And I cannot tell you how many times I have seen uh, poor transitions occur and um, having some negative outcomes. So that is why I'm excited to talk about this topic is to prevent that. Um, so I'm just gonna move to the next slide here. My objectives really for this presentation is to prepare whoever um, views this or listens to it uh, to really explore kind of what the what a healthcare transition is and some common issues and barriers um, and how a good transition can connect to person-centered care, which is what we really want. Um, I also want to talk about some transition management or care transition practice standards. Um, I think it's important as an informed consumer to understand what those standards are so you can help your providers be accountable to those standards. Um, I want to talk about some ways you can advocate for yourself and your loved ones, how you can be engaged and active in your healthcare transitions, rather than feeling like, oh, it's just happening to you and you don't have control over the situation. And I want to talk about some tips uh, to could that can help you plan and implement a good transition uh, for yourself or your loved one. To start, let's talk about what a healthcare transition is. Uh, I are, you know, you may say, oh, you know, it's it's when we're uh, moving from one place to another, and in a literal sense, it is. But a healthcare transition is a safe transition, and that is the key word there. It is a safe transition. It's not just moving from one setting to another, or one provider to a specialist, or or that sort of thing. It's that safe transition between settings and providers, um, and that there is continuity of the care. That nothing's dropped, nothing's lost. And it's based on um, the the concept and active cooperation and collaboration between providers and settings. So this is where as an informed consumer or caregiver, you can help your provider or setting that you're going to be accountable for this in collaborating and communicating with each other. <clears throat> the definition of a safe transition is one that is without interruption, without delays, it prevents negative outcomes. It has shared accountability between settings, providers, and the consumer or caregiver. So it is a collaborative process between all parties involved with, with the point of having good quality outcomes and without delays. And I do want to say, if you guys have any questions or comments as we're talking, go ahead and feel free to, to chime in. We're a small group here. I think we'll have lots of time uh, for questions and discussion. Um, so uh, don't wait for question and answer time if you if something comes to mind. Okay, so now that we kind of have our background, like what, what are we talking about? What a, what a safe transition is. Now I want to talk a little bit about what is person-centered care and how does a safe transition or a quality transition in healthcare support person-centered care? One of the key attributes of person-centered care is that it includes the person, the, the consumer, the caregiver, the participants. It is not provider-focused. And so this is something that um, I think as consumers and caregivers, we need to demand that we are part of the conversation. 
It responds to uh, the consumer or caregiver's individual preferences, goals, and priorities of care. So your provider in your healthcare transition to wherever you're going to a different setting or to a different specialist or involving other, other care uh, really should spend some time with you talking about, is this something you desire? Is it a need you have? What are your, out, what are your goals that you want? And it should be responsive to you. So, um, and integrated across the whatever continuum you're in. If we're talking about a, a, P, a primary care provider transitioning uh, your care to a specialist, or you're talking about moving from an acute care setting to a, re a rehabilitation setting, um, it should be responsive to these needs and priorities and goals that you're communicating. And it should offer you an opportunity to be empowered and engaged in making that plan with your provider or setting. So if, if you are not getting those things, then you are not getting person-centered care. Um, and, but that is something we want to support and encourage our providers and settings to offer our caregivers and consumers. And the big takeaway from that is that it involves an assessment. Your provider should be assessing um, your educational or training needs related to the transition, and you yourself should be doing some self-reflection about, okay, um, my, my loved one is leaving the acute care setting and coming home now. What kinds of things am I uncomfortable with? What kinds of things do I not know? What kinds of things do I feel like I need some additional information and be communicating that proactively? And that is your piece. That is your accountable piece of that person-centered care. So um, it really involves assessing what is needed for to address uh, barriers and create a successful, safe transition, which we talked about what that was. Um, so anyhow, I like to go over that because person-centered care is a concept that's kind of thrown around a lot. Um, and I think that as providers, we need, you know, to understand what that means. But I also think uh, consumers and caregivers need to understand it as well so they know whether they are receiving it or not. Um, okay. There are some common issues with healthcare transitions. We have transitions all the time. Um, you know, like I said, it could be between providers, it could be between settings. Um, people move in and out of different places in our healthcare system all of the time. And there are some very common issues with transitions in any kind of transition. And the first one is lack of communication. That is a key problem with a healthcare transition. As a consumer or caregiver, understanding that communication is a huge barrier to a safe transition um, is important because that can help you understand or notice if some communication issues aren't happening and bringing that to people's attention. Um, there's some reasons for that. A lot of it has to do with um, some people have concerns about HIPAA and sharing you know, information across settings or providers. Uh, sometimes different settings don't have the same electronic health record system, so it's difficult to transfer information. Um, sometimes people just aren't trained in a structured communication process for a transition. So there's a lot of reasons why communication is an issue, but it is, it is the biggest issue. Um, there's also a lack of clear communication with the consumer and caregiver. So if I'm transitioning a person from the acute care setting to, let's say, home health, they're going home with home health from the acute care setting, I may have great communication with the home health agency, but I may not be communicating well with you. Maybe I don't let you know when the home health nurse should be out. So you don't even know that, you know, four days later and the home health nurse hasn't been out, that that's an issue. I haven't communicated clearly to you. You don't, you maybe don't know what to expect. And this is another problem. Sometimes we kind of work in our clinician provider setting silo and, and forget that person-centered approach and really bringing in the consumer and caregiver into the conversation. So we have clear communication. 
which leads to that lack of person-centered care. And then um, these last two are very important. I think this is something that as a consumer or caregiver, you should really be aware of. There tends to be a lack of good education or information given to consumers and caregivers about a transition. And sometimes people may, uh, providers may think, well, you know, they didn't ask the question, so they must know. They haven't done a good assessment of the consumer or caregiver's learning needs or informational needs. And since you didn't ask the question, you just don't get the information. That is something I've seen a lot. And that is where you, as part of the person-centered care team, can advocate for yourself and acknowledge, you know, maybe I do need more information on what to expect from home health when I get home, or maybe I do need more information about how to use this a new durable medical equipment that's going to be delivered to my house and, and asking for that. Um, there also sometimes is a lack of teach back, and that is a process where somebody is providing a consumer or caregiver education, but um, they, they, it ends there. I gave you the education, we're done. Uh, you have it. I hand you a, a pamphlet or a brochure or a piece of paper and say, you know, if you have questions, read this when you get home. I don't ask you to tell me in your own words what, what you learned from this educational intervention. I don't know. I don't check. I don't make sure that you did learn that information that is important for the good transition. So if you're not receiving teach back, from your provider uh, concerning a healthcare transition or really anything, um, then you should be asking, you know, hey, can I tell you what I heard you say or what I learned from this, this education you gave me? And really do a check, uh, not just, you know, leaving uh, it with, oh, here's a, pam a pamphlet to read later when you have time. So those are all common issues that cause problems with healthcare transitions. Um, so what can go wrong? Why do we care about this? And maybe you've experienced some of these things yourself already. Well, the biggest problem in a poor healthcare transition are medication errors, which can lead to readmissions, can lead to complications, um, can lead to emergency room visits. And these medication errors aren't necessarily an error like, oh, I gave the wrong medication. Um, it's errors understanding how to take a medication, what medications to discontinue, what medications to continue. Um, if some medications have different dosages and maybe maybe the consumer or caregiver doesn't understand that when to have those different dosages. So medication errors are the biggest problem. Lack of follow-up is a huge issue as well. Um, you let's say you you were tra you transitioned to a rehab center. Um, the rehab center then discharges you home with follow-up with your primary care provider. Um, but somehow or another, you don't get the memo that you were supposed to have a follow-up appointment in a couple of weeks and you don't go to it. And this can cause problems. Or maybe they make the follow-up appointment, you're aware of it, but you, for whatever reason, have difficulty getting to that appointment, so you don't go. And that can cause um readmissions, emergency room visits, poor outcomes. So that's another thing that can go wrong. And of course, all of those things lead to increased costs for uh, consumers and caregivers, increased resource use, increased um, stress, decreased satisfaction, uh, start of delay cares, and poor outcomes like falls and injuries. So uh, this is why healthcare transitions, it's very important to understand and as a consumer or caregiver advocate for yourself in the process. Okay, so I'm just gonna pause for a moment for the people that are here. Have you experienced other issues with a healthcare transition that I didn't go over that but were problematic for you or seen them with other people? COVID was a big one. COVID. Uh somebody going into long-term care and especially dealing with dementia, just not, not, um, surviving really mm -hmm. even to quarantine. Mm -hmm. That was probably a really hard story. 
where families were basically separated through that quarantine process. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and I think sometimes, you know, especially in my experience during the COVID uh, time, I think sometimes there wasn't good communication with the family. See that non-clear communication with the family, but why is this happening? What's going on? What are the expectations? And then of course it caused for a very rough transition where people were very dissatisfied. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's see, we have a chat here. Um, not being adequately prepared to take care of a loved one. Yes. And this absolutely. Um, and this is why consumers and caregivers have to be activated in the healthcare transition, because I think sometimes they expect providers to somehow know or understand what the person needs for a good transition home, but maybe they don't do a good assessment. They don't provide good education. They don't provide clear communication. And then the person goes home, they're not prepared. And then they return back to the emergency room because the family can't take care of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, let's see. Okay, yes. Instructions are given to the patient, not the caregiver. Yes. And home medications are not discussed. Absolutely. Because so that leads to those medication errors where people are taking both the blood pressure medication they have at home and the new blood pressure medication. And then they become hypotensive and end up in the emergency room. Um, or the patient is, give, you're right, they're given the instructions and sometimes the patients don't retain them very well or don't understand them very well. And we don't have that second person, uh, support person to help with that. Absolutely. And that can cause problems because then things aren't followed up on. Okay, good. Very good. Okay. So we don't want any of that to happen. We want other things to happen. <laughs> we want good things to happen. Um. So... I wanna go over the standards of healthcare transitions. And these are national professional standards, okay? This is not, not made up stuff. Um, and to be an informed consumer and caregiver, I need to understand these standards so I can demand that I am getting that service, that care that, is, that I should be getting. Um, in a healthcare transition, whether it is to another provider or another setting, some form of risk identification should be occurring. So the provider should be talking to the caregiver or whatever's going on, trying to find out, are there some risks? I'm going to send that, like I think Deb said, you know, they go home and they're not, or maybe it was Mike, said they go home and they're not prepared. I need to do an assessment. It is, does the house have three flights of stairs and the person's using a wheelchair? You know, um, is there some risk like that? If I'm not doing an assessment as a provider, I'm, I'm not going to be able to identify risks. And if you're not communicating to me, hey, I have some concerns, you're sending my loved one home in a wheelchair and I have three flights of stairs, um, then we, we end up with a problem. Um, so that can be an issue people not doing a good risk identification. So the polypharmacy issue, so that, that's one a big one, the medication errors they have. Looking, having the provider look at all the medications and between the settings, the home setting and the clinical setting, if there's cognitive or functional impairments that need to be addressed uh, for a good transition. And if they have frequent inpatient admissions or emergency room use. So this is something your provider should be looking at or asking about because if somebody has frequent inpatient admissions or emergency room use, it usually signifies that something isn't being taken care of in the home setting. Something is amiss that needs to be addressed to support the person to stay home. So um, if you're experiencing that as a caregiver and your loved one is having frequent ad inpatient admissions or emergency room visits, you know, talk to your providers about that so they can do a good risk identification, risk assessment. Um, healthcare transitions should also have comprehensive assessment. 
So looking at advanced care planning, um, activities of daily living, also instrumental activities of daily living. So instrumentals like can they use, can people use the phone? Can they pay their bills? Can they cook for themselves? Uh, not just can they shower and get, you know, get in and out of bed. That's, that's more the ADLs. And sometimes people don't think about these functional issues that can cause poor transitions. Because if I'm unable to use a phone and call for assistance, if I'm unable to cook for myself um, or go grocery shopping, then this could cause problems, poor outcomes for me, and I could be returning to the hospital setting. Um, they should be discussing decision-making processes and if, if there's issues with, you, with the consumer being able to manage their own health. These are all conversations that should be made. And then, of course, we've talked about medications. Those medications should be reconciled, verified with the consumer and care, caregiver, just like um, I think Deb said that. Um, looking at prescribed and non-prescribed. So, um, you know, you're prescribed Norco, but you're taking, you know, four Tylenols a day as, as well, right? This is, that would be problematic. So looking at those over-the-counter things. Um, and then the last thing that people often don't think should be assessed in medications or people don't ask them about it, but they should be asking you about it, is are you having issues with it? So are there problematic side effects going on or are there problems administering the medication? Um, and if you are having those things, you should be communicating those to the, the provider because things can be done to, to, to help that. Um, okay. Other healthcare transition standards include there should be a care plan, and this is, should be communicated with the consumer and caregiver and jointly developed, talking about if there's referrals, if there's consultations, if there's resources that need to be followed up on, um, what the goals of care are, who's accountable for what. Uh, this should all be part of that transition discussion. And there should be good cross-setting communication talking about um, follow-up and the timing of that. And by that, I mean, sometimes if you are discharged from a hospital setting and you'll have your discharge summary, it'll say, you know, Jane has a follow-up appointment on Tuesday, you know, the 30th of April at 2 p.m. with her primary care provider. And... I may see that and the discharge person may go over that with me or with my caregiver or both of us. Um, but maybe I also just started warfarin and I need to have um, labs once a week between now and April 30th to monitor my um, anticoagulation levels. So what I'm saying is we really need to look at that whole big picture. You know, are there labs? That need to be followed up on? Are there um, appointments? Are there uh, medications that have to be started at a specific time? Um, is there referrals to, you know, to specialists? Maybe I've been referred to a diabetic educator and that has some timing related to that. So um, when we think about cross-setting communication as a consumer and caregiver, we have to think about the whole picture, all the people involved, and that can be very uh, big sometimes. And your whoever's doing coordinating the transition of care for you should be going over those things with you. Okay. Um, I'm gonna pause there for a second before I go on the next one. Did anybody have any questions? These are basic standards, the cross-setting communication, care plan, risk identification, comprehensive assessment, and medication reconciliation. Um, have you guys been experiencing that kind of approach with your transitions for the most part? Maybe. Okay, nobody's yelling, yes, I have it all the time. Okay, so um, so we need to hold our providers accountable for these standards. You know, we, we deserve to be treated in person-centered care and this is part of it, having 
uh, following uh, national standards. Okay. Um, there are some things, we've already talked about some of these, but this is something as a consumer or, or caregiver more to be aware of. All right, so you're moving, your, your loved one's moving from one setting to another. Oh, we have a couple chats here. Okay, weakness with transition from the ER to facility. Yes, I would agree with that. I case managed in an ER for a long time. It's, it, it can be very problematic. <laughs> and Mike says he does those standards. Okay, good. <laughs> um, okay, so as consumer and caregivers, or we're providers and we're educating consumers and caregivers, we want to make sure that they know that all these things should be occurring. Follow-up appointments, labs is needed. Those need to be all documented and communicated to the consumer caregiver in the next setting. Notification of the transition to the primary care provider. This is a, something that frequently does not happen. And what the problem with that is that then if follow-up is needed, the primary care provider doesn't even know it. Um, or uh, the primary care provider doesn't know that medications have changed. And this can cause medication problems. So that is essential. And if you're not sure your primary care provider has been notified of the transition, um, you can ask whoever's coordinating the, the transition or you yourself can notify the primary, primary care provider. Um, accountability is key. So oftentimes things will be, you know, I might say, hey, um, you know, Joe, I set up this appointment for you. Here's your list of appointments. These are things you need to do. It's all on this piece of paper. So don't lose that. Refer to it so you know what you need to follow up with. But nobody's really accountable. So um, Joe's not saying back to me, yes, Jane, I understand I'm accountable to go to this follow-up appointment. You know, I know this is something I need to do. And I'm not taking time with Joe to communicate the importance of the accountability of follow-up. So really making sure that we know who's accountable for what is key to a good transition. Um, other essential things, if you need medical equipment, it should be arranged. Um, the, the medical equipment should be arranged for you. You should understand when it's gonna be delivered. Um, you should be able to choose who's providing it. Um, you know, don't go home without needed medical equipment or don't go to a new place without needed medical equipment. Medications we've already talked about, allergies, um, kind of go with medications. Discharge summary, we've kind of talked about. But th this, this red flag one is something that often isn't covered either. So if somebody's having a transition, let's say they're going from, you know, rehab back home, um, a red flag is, when do I need to call the doctor? When do I need to go to the emergency room? What are the important signs and symptoms that mean something is going awry in my health or my loved one's health? Um, and I should understand what those, as a consumer or caregiver, I should understand what those red flags are. And somebody should be communicating to me what they are. And if they're not, then I need to ask for that. Um, because how do I know when I should go to the doctor? Maybe I let things go too long. Um, and I've seen that happen too. People think they, they go home and they're not feeling well. They're, you know, having headaches and um, and they think, oh, it's just going to pass or whatever. Well, the next thing you know, they, they've had a stroke and now they have a very negative outcome. So uh, red flags are important. And who do you contact about that? So let's say I do go home and I'm, I'm experiencing a red flag symptom, who do I call about that? Is there a doctor, a case manager, a discharge planner, a transition coach, a patient navigator? Who, who do I contact about these things? And I should know that. And then if there's any other additional information. So uh, these are things we can help our consumers and caregivers understand that they need to know. Okay. Um, the next part I want to talk about is how do we 
as consumers and caregivers um, advocate for ourselves. But before I move on that, I'll pause. Does anybody have any comments or questions before we move to self-advocacy, my favorite topic? Okay. All right. I don't see anything in the chat yet. Okay. But feel free to chat or say. Um, so self-advocacy is so important. Um, with the transition of our healthcare system to value-based healthcare and person-centered care, moving from that disease-focused kind of provider dynamic uh, experience that puts accountability for advocacy on the consumer and caregiver as well. We are partners with our providers. We are not recipients only. This is a dynamic um, relationship-based experience where we're working together for good outcomes. This is where our health care system is wanting to go and should go. And that requires patients or consumers or caregivers or people that are participating in the system to understand how to advocate for themselves, which sometimes can be scary and new and overwhelming. So um, we need to work on providing good education about that. What I always say to people is, uh, when I'm working with people, you are the expert on yourself. I don't know your life. I don't know your life situation. I don't know your lived experience. Um, I may know some specific things about your health or what's going on, but you are the expert on yourself and you are your own best advocate. Um, so since that's the case, consumers and caregivers should really think about if they need time to talk to a provider, then uh, they need to let them, they need to let the provider know that. Providers typically only have 10 minutes to see a, a, a person. That is not much time to answer and address questions. So let's say you do your caregiver and you have questions about your, lo your loved one or the person you're caring for. And I have my, my appointment set up and I'm going to go there and ask, you know, I have 15 questions. Well, that provider probably is gonna tell me, I don't have time to answer your questions, Jane. So uh, we have to be a little proactive about that. If we have a lot of questions, we need to let the person know when we're making the appointment that, you know, I have some questions for my provider and I would like a little extra time. So if you could make the appointment a few more minutes, that would be great. So we could have a few more minutes to talk about that. Um, we can also use our patient portals to send questions ahead of time before appointments. Uh, I have heard though now that they're starting to charge a fee. <laughs> Providers are starting to charge a fee for answering messages in patient portals sometimes. So this, I'm not sure how that's gonna go, but I think it's, it's something that started. But you do have the patient portal and you can um, send email messages to your provider and that it was something you should utilize. Um, always, whatever the case, bring your questions with you on your phone, a notepad, whatever works, so you can make sure you have your questions addressed at your appointments. And lastly, if you feel overwhelmed or you're not sure you're going to remember things, bring someone along uh, to help you, to support you through that experience, to hear the same things you hear. And then um, afterwards, you can guide, you can discuss with them, well, this is what I heard. Is that what you heard? So um, always, you know, if you feel like you need a support person, don't be afraid to bring one. That is your right to do that. Um, and this is kind of a longer thing, but there are some things we can do to self-advocate. Um, first of all, understanding what we need for a successful transition. So what are the standards of transition practice? Um, what are our educational needs? What are our uh, things we're concerned about, our barriers? How, how, what's our environment like? Is our home setting gonna be difficult or problematic? Are we feeling burnout as a caregiver and we need some support? Um, 
really kind of doing some time to reflect on what is it that you you need for a successful transition and communicating that. Asking questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, sometimes I've had this experience. Maybe you guys have too. Uh, sometimes providers are kind of like not open to questions. They're busy and they're like, oh yeah, well, we already talked about that, Jane, or you know, <laughs> something like that. Um, don't be put off. If you have a question and you don't feel like it's been answered, um, ask it again. You do have the right to choose things. This is something too that I think sometimes uh, consumers and caregivers don't understand. You have the right to choose to transition or not transition. You have the right to say no. If I don't like where somebody's wanting to send me, I have the right to say, no, I don't want to go there. Now, there may be some consequences to that, um, which is a different topic, but, you know, related to insurance coverage and contracts and things like that. But I have the right to say no, and that's okay. So you do always have the right to choose um, and to participate. You also um, can be just being aware of your nonverbal language and your verbal language, how you're listening, what kind of communication skills you're using can help you advocate for yourself. And then um, these last couple things I think are really important. Become informed. If you don't know anything about where the transition, like, you know, I'm going um, from acute care to rehab, and I don't know anything about this rehab place, or I don't think I need it, I don't want to go, become informed about that. Why, why is this the team's, the healthcare team's recommendation? Um, what, what is the plan? What's the goal? What's the outcome? And um, you can access, CMS has star rating systems. You can access that rating system. I think it's called CARE. Yeah, care compare. Um, and you can, you know, type in home health for Boise, Idaho, and they'll give you ratings on home health agencies that you can look at as a consumer. Um, visit places. Don't just go to say, oh, well, this is all that's available for you, Jane. This is where you have to go. You know, visit the place if you can or have um, a caregiver or loved one visit the place for you and see what they think set up a get to know you visit with a new provider, make sure it's a good fit for you, uh, become informed. And then the last thing here is to keep an open mind. Um, sometimes we may think that we don't wanna do something, but then after we become informed, we ask questions, we go, well, maybe this is a good thing to do. And the other thing is to keep documents. Um, don't just put them on your kitchen table and leave them there to be recycled. Uh, those documents are very sometimes very important. I will give you an example of that. Um, my mother-in-law had vascular dementia and she, um, she was having some problems with medications, taking her medications. And I asked to see her discharge summary from her last hospital visit. So I could see what was prescribed at her discharge. Um, and she showed it to me and it was from a discharge a, the, the year before. So she was going off documents that were old. And then when I asked her for the up-to-date document, she said, well, this is the only one I have. So then of course we had to do some investigation, figure out what exactly she was supposed to be taking. So keep documents and make sure you're going off the most recent document, especially when we're talking about medications and follow-up. We don't want to be going, having our, you know, loved ones going off documents that are a year old. So, okay. Um, oh, see, we're all, it's so much to talk about with transitions and we're running out of time. Okay. So, um, more things you can do. I mean, there's so many things we can help our ourselves and our loved ones, or if we're providers working with consumers and caregivers, there's so many things we can do to support them to be activated and engaged. Really making sure people have access to their, their documents, their health summaries, either electronic or 
hard copy. Um, ha having them know how to contact providers to keep them up to date with things that are going on. Like, oh, you know, my loved one just got admitted to, to the intensive care unit and letting the provider know that. Learning about what's going on, what the diagnoses are, what the treatments are, what the medications are, why they're being given, uh, what the recommendations are, so we can make informed decisions about whether we really want to do that or not. Learning about resources and support groups in the community, obviously, so we don't get burnt out and we can get assistance when we need it. Recognizing when we're feeling burnt out if we're a caregiver. Um, and having an action plan. Okay, I'm. I, these are the things that happen when I'm feeling burnout and my action plan is X, Y, Z when that happens. Uh, seeking out education and training on how to, you know, if you need help with conflict, managing behaviors, the diagnoses, uh, what's needed for a good transition home, whatever education you need. But I'm gonna say, this this next one is the most important one, I think, to me. Letting your care team know about barriers to a good transition. Um, like I said, you're the expert on yourself. If I'm planning a, a transition, I don't know if you don't have money for medications unless you tell me or I ask you directly. I don't know if transportation is an issue for you unless you tell me or I ask you directly. Um, hopefully, I'm doing some kind of assessment for caregiver burnout. And maybe I have some semblance of that. But if you're feeling that way, it'd be great if you could communicate that to me as well. If you're having insecurity, uh, housing insecurity, food insecurity, anything like that, letting people know these are issues, not to be embarrassed or ashamed about that. Because, um, because if we're going to have a good transition, we have to address all these things. I, you know, sending somebody home to a house with no electricity or water is not a good transition. So we we have to know that to set to set up a good transition and and people need to be validated that it's okay if you're experiencing that and not to feel like they can't share those things. Which goes with the next one, developing a good relationship and lastly ensuring that you have all of your questions answered. You feel confident, you feel clear. You know the plan. You know who's accountable. You what you know what's due next week. And if you don't, then you know, asking again until you do. So I think those are things we can help people do. Okay. Um, and I think we're getting close to the end. But before we do, um, yep, I think I just have a uh, cut one, one more thing. Does anybody have any other self-advocacy tools they'd like to share with the group that they've used that works for them? Because I went over a lot there. A lot of things we can help people, support people to do. Okay. All right. Then I have one last thing I want to talk about, and then we're done. We'll do some questions if we have them. Um. I am a checklist person. So, and especially when people are feeling overwhelmed, uh, which often is the case in a transition. They don't know what to expect. They don't know what's going on. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of people involved. They don't know who they are. Okay, Mike says he tries to write down questions before the appointment. Yes, absolutely. Um, and a checklist is kind of that same concept, right? I have my list to go off of, so nothing is missing. And some things we can do is, uh, you know, we've already talked about these good things of a good healthcare transition, collaboration, communication, information, medication safety, education, uh, interprofessional and person-centered care, follow-up, right? This is what we want. So how do we get there? We have our transition. We know it's going to happen. How do we know the transition's good? Um, there are some things we can do, and I think we've talked about some of these already, and then I'm going to end with a checklist that you can use if you want. 
<clears throat> again, taught, letting people know what your preferences are. I want to go to this facility, not that facility. I want this medication, not that medication. Researching things. Don't just taking just don't just take things off. Um, you know, somebody's recommendation unless it's somebody you trust. I've had I've had people often ask me, "Oh, Jane, why don't you know I'm doing planning discharge?" And I'll say, "Jane, oh, you just pick." And it's like I say to them, "I can't pick. I'm not you. You know, I don't know what your what's really important to you. I can tell you what I know, and I can." You know, you can go to the star ratings. You could talk to a family member, a friend, and get some recommendations. You go visit places, get some information, and then make a decision. But, you know, sometimes consumers and caregivers don't want to do that piece, but it is a very important piece. It's empowering, and it helps them really understand the transition and, and what to expect. So I think it's very important. And then... um you know, the checklist, which I'll go over next, involving other people. If if the consumer caregiver is feeling overwhelmed, you know, in, ask they can involve another friend, another caregiver, another family member. Uh, the more, the merrier, as long as they're not in conflict uh, to get things going on. Have your prescription, have your medication list. Okay, I have another, I have another story about medication list. Um, so important. And I was in a, I was in a doctor's office once waiting for an appointment. And there was an elderly woman there with her daughter, adult daughter. And the elderly woman had taken out her medication list and she was kind of reviewing them before her appointment and, um, you know, what they were for. And she was like, you know, daughter, I take this for that. Right. That's what it says here. And the daughter said to her, she says, mom, why do you even need to know that? And it was just a tragic event because here was this woman trying to be empowered in her health, trying to understand her medications, trying to be prepared for her appointment, and her family member wasn't supporting that. So because they didn't think it's important, oh, the doctor's going to take care of it or whatever. Well, we don't know that for a fact. We have to know our medications. So having a list, um, obtaining needed equipment, and these last two are super important. If your loved one's coming home from a rehab, acute care, or some other setting, LTAC or whatever, do a home safety assessment. Walk through your house. You know, is there something in the house that is going to be problematic? They're coming home in a wheelchair and I have hallways that are two feet wide, you know, or I don't have an eight, I don't have a bathroom that's accessible. Uh Think about those prior to the transition. And again, if you, hopefully your discharge person who's planning the transition is asking you questions about this, <laughs> but if they're not, then let them know, uh, you know, Hey, I, this is not a good plan. It's not going to work for my house. Um, so, so do that proactively and then also review your finances. This is important. Um, sometimes facilities that you want are not contracted with your insurance provider. And so that is really not an option for you. Uh, know what, know what facilities are contracted with your insurance provider, know what the co-pays are, um, know what the length of stay limits are, because there are length of stay limits, understand your insurance and review that. If, if you're unable to have a family caregiver and you need caregiving, that is an out-of-pocket expense, as we all know, can be very expensive. So what's that going to look like? I mean, unless you have Medicaid, then sometimes it's not. But really thinking about the financial impact of things, and you can't always assume that your provider or the person coordinating your transition is knowledgeable about this. So it's another piece that you can bring to the to, to the table to advocate for yourself. Okay, then I'm going to end with this. Here is my healthcare transition checklist. So if you are going on, a, you're being transitioned, these are the things that as a consumer or caregiver, you should ensure have happened. You understand the reason for the transition. You have had the medications reviewed with you. You have a plan in place to pick them up. 
at a pharmacy, you understand how, how to take them, why they're being taken, what the red flags of the medications are, if there's potential interactions or side effects that you need to know about. Barriers to the transition plan have been addressed, like, you know, accessibility to a bathroom or transportation to follow-up appointments. Those have been addressed. Your needs and goals have been addressed in the transition plan. You know, I want to go home with home health. I don't want to go to rehab. That's been part of the transition plan. Resources that you need have been arranged or you have been given the information and you feel comfortable arranging them yourself. The transition plan has been given to you and your primary care provider in a documented format that is that has a clear timeline of the transition, knows who's in, you know who is involved in the transition, you know the next steps in the transition, the who, what, when, where, how, and why of that transition is clearly documented. You understand the next care setting or referral. So if it's like a provider to specialist referral, you understand what to expect from them. If there's anything you need to do to prepare for the, the visit or transition, equipment's in place, or there's a timeline or plan for that equipment to be in place that works for you, not for someone else. Your questions are addressed, follow-up appointments are scheduled, and you know what they are, when they are, and you know how you're going to get them, uh, get to them. If tests are needed, you know how to get them, where to get them, when to get them. You've had the red flags reviewed, and most importantly, you know who to contact if you have a question and you have their contact information. So those are all things that should happen in, um, in a transition. Okay, and that's all I have to say, which is good because we only got five minutes. Uh, there's so much to say. <laughs> And yes, yes, Deb. Um, yeah, I created that list and I'm happy to share that with everybody. Um, but I think that is, that's what I think everybody should have that. Okay. Um, that is the end of my presentation and we have a few minutes left. Are there any other comments or questions? I know we went over a lot of information. Uh, is there a that can go to a kind of coach or something where they can be guided from, well, throughout this whole process, um, a lot of times, like I'm, I'm a director of an area agency on aging up in North Central Idaho. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm beginning to understand is that a lot of families are not doing any um, preparation. They're not doing the research. They're not making decisions. They don't have their paperwork together. Mm -hmm. So when the, the medical issues arise or the need for long-term care comes up, it happens because there's an emergency. Somebody fell, somebody got hurt, whatever. Um, if you're out of state, all these things that we just don't put mind to come up and they're, they come up immediately. Like we need it now. We don't have time to, you know, like when you're you're buying a car and you're doing it because the clutch went out on your last one and you got to get to work. <laughs> not, yeah. not because you're doing a, a good checklist, same kind of thing, but with our parents. Um, so then they get into this and then everything's rushed and everything's confused and then, and they don't know who to go to, but then it's the caregiver who has no idea what they're doing. Who's trying to navigate the whole thing. Yeah. And they go into the hospital and they come out of the hospital and they got to make all these decisions. Is there, is there any kind of umbrella organization or resource where somebody can get coached? through that process? So that is a very good question. And I'm not familiar with North Idaho in that sense. I do know in the Treasure Valley area where I've worked, there are some private individuals that charge to do that. They, you know, you pay out of pocket to have them do that. Sure. Um, but it is a real need and it makes me think, hey, we need to start that. <laughs> You know, a, a, yeah, yeah, no, it's totally a, a, a huge need because not everybody can afford to pay somebody. I don't even know. I think they were charging like $50 an hour or something, some amount of money to, to do the transition coaching. So, um, but there are some companies in the Treasure Valley that do that for a fee. And let's see, okay. we have a chat. We have a chat. Oh, you're very welcome, Deb. 
Um, but Todd, I love that question. It makes me think, yeah, I want to do that. I want to do it because I'm so passionate about uh, good transitions. I've just seen them go bad so often and there's really no reason for it. You know, so if if we're proactive, working together, collaboratively, person-centered, you know. Um, okay, other, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer to your question, but that's my answer. <laughs> no, but, and that's also informative, so thank you. Um, maybe other people know resources I don't. That's, if you do, please put them in the chat. Um, other questions? Don't, no other questions. Okay, well, I wanna thank you guys for the opportunity to share my passion. This is a passion I have. And um, I just feel like if we can prepare consumers and caregivers, they're going to have a much better experience um, and they can be empowered and, and help themselves in the process, which is, you know, we can't rely on clinicians all the time to do that because sometimes they don't do a very good job. <laughs>